Oh my God, guys. So today there was a huge announcement about an extremely severe exploit for Wi-Fi and the vulnerability is in WPA2, which is what basically every single Wi-Fi device on the planet uses. And it's being called CRACK, K-R-A-C-K, which stands for Key Reinstallation Attack. So in this video, I'm gonna tell you about what it is, why it's so severe, and what you can possibly do to protect yourself, even though there's not much to do right now. And I'm also gonna give a reasonably detailed explanation about how it works, because it is pretty simple and very interesting, and I'll explain it in a way that really anyone can understand. So it turns out that this vulnerability was actually discovered by a security researcher back in 2016, but it was a very closely guarded secret while it was researched and then finally was announced publicly just the other day. And this exploit is for all computer platforms. So we're talking Windows, Linux, Mac OS, iOS, Android. It's because it has to do with the Wi-Fi itself, not any software. And it's actually a set of vulnerabilities, not just one, but they're all kind of based around the same idea. So what might be vulnerable on one system and device might not be the same, but pretty much every device has all of these basically. Oh, and by the way, if you're wondering, well, is my device affected? Maybe it's not. The answer is yes, it is affected. Everything uses WPA, and if it's not, then it's using WEP, which means that it's even less secure probably. So don't switch to WEP, that's not gonna help. Keep using WPA2 and just wait for the patch. However, if you're using Linux or Android 6.0 and later, you're actually extra screwed because there's an even worse version of this exploit that takes advantage of a certain version of uh, the Wi-Fi protocol called WPA Supplicant. It's like a piece of software that Linux and Android use. And there is a vulnerability in that piece of software that is even worse. And that's because with this particular piece of software, it allows a hacker to install an all zeros encryption key which basically is a blank key. So it removes all protection extremely easily, trivially they said. So basically anyone can just see literally everything that your Android device is doing super easily. Keep in mind that doesn't mean that if you're not using Linux or Android that you're protected. It just means that you're extra screwed again if you're on Android or Linux, but you're not protected even if you're on something else. And you might be wondering, well, why is it so bad if a hacker does this? And the answer is, well, it basically makes it the equivalent of using a completely unsecured Wi-Fi hotspot. It means that hackers can not only listen into what you're saying, but they can also broadcast out fake packets to inject malware into the websites you're visiting, maybe replace downloads that you go to download and install malware, ransomware, all sorts of viruses. It can do a lot because the hacker now has control of what's going in and out of your device. Now, one very important thing to know is that this attack is client-based, which means that it's not attacking an access point or a router, but rather every single individual device. And I'll explain why that is later, it'll make sense. But basically this is kind of good and kind of bad depending on how you look at it. It's good in the sense that you can have control over whether you're vulnerable to this because you can individually choose to go and update all of your devices. And if you do that and you patch all your devices when the patches come out, then you're protected. It doesn't matter if the store that you go to has patched their devices or not because you got yourself covered. But obviously this is also bad because you need to update every single device and maybe some of the devices will take a long time to get a patch if they get a patch at all. The manufacturer might be obsolete, they don't even offer patches anymore, and then you're screwed. Now, this doesn't mean that there won't be patches for routers, because there will be. In fact, some manufacturers like Cisco are already starting to roll out some patches for like their enterprise systems, so that will actually protect against any devices on that particular network that has a patched router, but that still doesn't mean that you don't need to patch all of your devices. You have to do both. You're gonna have to patch your router and all of your devices. Because say your friends come over and you don't have a patched router, but maybe all your devices are patched, but then all your friends are gonna be exposed too because their devices might not be patched. At the same time, you can't just patch your router and not patch your devices because when you're out and about, you don't know if any other stores have patched their devices. So you really have to do both, which is a pain. So right now, the big thing to do is keep an eye out for any security patches, 
firmware updates on your router, all of that because they're definitely gonna be coming out sooner than later, although it might take a couple weeks. I do believe if you're using Windows, Microsoft has released a patch, a security patch. So update Windows right away and hopefully you should be covered in that case. But if you're using a phone or something, definitely install any security patches that come out the second you can, which will be an issue because we know that a lot of times cell carriers might not push Android updates, for example, as soon as they can. I think this is gonna be a big issue. All right, so let me go over what you can do right now to mitigate or at least somewhat protect yourself against this attack, obviously besides patching your computer and all that. First of all, changing your Wi-Fi password will not help. That has nothing to do with this attack. In fact, you won't need to change it later either because this attack doesn't allow the hacker to get your Wi-Fi password, so you won't need to change that. Another thing you should do is use a VPN. I've talked about this before, a virtual private network. They're paid services, but they basically double encrypt your data. So it encrypts it before it even sends it out. And then even if a hacker were to decrypt all your data, it's still encrypted in that special tunnel so they can't see anything within that. And that's the same advice I gave on another video when you're using a regular old unsecured Wi-Fi public network, you should always connect to those using a VPN because the same stuff that someone could do with this attack here, they could do on any public network. So if you use a VPN, you should be okay. Also, you're gonna wanna double check that any website you go onto that you want to be secure has HTTPS, SSL, TLS, the little lock, whatever, you know what I'm talking about, it's encrypted. And the reason you need to double check is because even if you're, you know a website usually uses HTTPS, there are scripts out there that a hacker could use in conjunction with this exploit to take advantage of websites that don't have the encryption, encrypted connection properly configured. So even if a website usually uses HTTPS, if you don't look and double check, someone could remove that and before you know it, you look up there and it's not actually encrypted even though you thought it was. If it says HTTPS, you're probably fine, but you wanna double check because it might have been removed. All right, so now let me explain how exactly this attack works. It's not gonna teach you how to hack your neighbor's Wi-Fi, what coding exactly to use, but it will give you a pretty darn good idea of how this works and I'll explain it in a way that is really easy to understand even if you think you're not very tech savvy. So it should be pretty interesting. I recommend you listen to it so you can get a better idea of how this works. All right, so here's the deal. When a device connects to a router using WPA2, the encryption method, then it uses what is called a four-way handshake. It means there's gonna be four messages going between the router and the device before the secure connection is established. So it's basically just negotiating like, oh, hey, I'm here. It's like, oh, okay, I see you. And it's like, okay, let's come up with a encryption key. Okay, and then it negotiates an encryption key and then everything's secure. On the third message, that is when the device, like your phone, actually installs the agreed upon key that will be used for encrypting everything later. But what a hacker can do is actually capture that third message and then resend it as many times as it wants. So it kind of listens in and then can broadcast it out so the device will keep getting that message. And here's where the exploit kind of differs depending on the system. So on Android and Linux, I talked about how it was extra screwed and that is because when the hacker captures that third message, even though it doesn't know what's in it, it can send it over to the phone, and then when that phone gets that third message again, it will reinstall the key that it was supposed to do before. But on Android and Linux, the problem is it doesn't reinstall the encryption key, it reinstalls a blank key, an all zeros key. So if you wanna hack an Android or Linux device with this exploit, all you have to do is listen for what the router sends as the third message, send it to the phone again after it gets it, and then it has no encryption anymore. It, it's an all zero key that you obviously don't even have to figure out, it's just all zeros. So that explains why Android and Linux are like extra screwed because it's so simple 
but there is a different way this works on other devices, which is a little bit more complicated, but once you understand what's going on, it's really not that difficult. So with these other devices, the first part you need to understand is when a device decides on an encryption key, it can't just keep using that same exact key for every single message it sends out. Otherwise, if it was using the same key every time, a hacker would be able to use that to kind of reverse engineer or calculate the key backwards. And so they would use this with known information. So it knows that eventually it's gonna, your computer is gonna send out some type of data. So for example, we know that probably Windows is gonna send out a time request to figure out and sync the time for the computer. We know that a computer is gonna do this. We know it's gonna do it pretty regularly. So now that we know the content of the message, we can use that to figure out what the key must be to result in the encrypted message we got. Now, okay, that might sound pretty complicated. Let me give a dead simple example that illustrates this. So say we have a secret equation that we don't want people to really figure out. And this equation is X plus Y equals 50, where X is some piece of content that's gonna be encrypted and changed. Y is this encryption key and then 50 is the encrypted result. So it's the same way with a router. You take some information, you do something to it, and you get a encrypted piece of information. And in this equation, 50 is obviously going to change with the content. Y is the encryption key, and it is not going to change. In this case, we're gonna show the vulnerability. It's gonna be the same encryption key every time. And then X obviously is also going to change because it's the different content for each message. Now, obviously looking at this equation, X and Y could be anything. It could be one and 49, it could be 20 and 30, it could be negative 500 and 550. So you're not gonna be able to ever figure out what X and Y are just from the final result of 50. However, if we happen to know that the content of the message, or in this case, the variable X is going to be 10 or some other known value, we now have two variables. We have the final result and we have what is probably the content of the message. So we can use that to calculate the key. So maybe the next equation the computer does is X plus Y equals 30. So we can try 10 as the thing and that would say 20. So we could say, okay, maybe the, the encryption key is 20. Now we don't know based on one thing. So we can look at multiple equations the computer does, and if the number 20 keeps coming up as the final result for the key, then we can say, okay, well, yeah, the encryption key is probably 20 because it keeps coming up, and we know that it's probably as a result of this same known value being used repeatedly. And this will not take long, by the way. The computer sends out thousands and thousands of packets every second, so it might take a couple seconds to calculate what the key is. So clearly what you need to do is get a new key every time. But obviously you don't have to negotiate a new key for every message. You'd be sending four messages for every one message that you want to actually send. So what we'll do instead is change the key every time with a predetermined method or parameter. So maybe every time we do a calculation, we increase the value of Y by one. So maybe the encryption key is 20, next time it's 21, next time it's 22. So now we can't figure out what the key is like we did before using multiple messages because the value of Y or the key is gonna be different every time. And here's the thing, even if the hacker knows that you're changing the key by one every time, they know how you're changing it, they don't know where you started. So they can't figure it out either way. And kind of like how I showed before, you need to do this on multiple messages because yeah, we might know that the computer is gonna send out 10 as the content pretty often, but we don't know for sure what it is. So we need multiple data samples and we need to know that, okay, we're getting back this number pretty frequently, this must be it, but if you're changing the key every time, you can't do that same calculation. You can't do it with just one. You need to do it at least a few times. But here's the thing. You don't wanna change the key just so people can't receive data and decrypt what you're sending. 
you wanna make it so people can't resend things that you've already sent. An example is maybe you're doing an online order and yes, it's encrypted. No one can see what it is, but if you send using the same key and it's the same exact encrypted message, then you can send out an order and say, oh, I wanna order uh, one box of chocolate. Then someone can receive that message and keep resending it and say, oh, I wanna order another box of chocolate, another box of chocolate. And before you know, you've ordered 500 boxes of chocolate. But if you change the key slightly every time, then when the person recaptures it and sends it out, the server will be like, wait a minute, we, we already got that one and you wouldn't send it again and it just ignores it. And funny enough, before we go on to the rest of the explanation, here's a fun fact. So back in World War II, the Germans had the Enigma machine, which was a encryption machine for sending out messages. And they changed their code every single day. However, they didn't change it with every single message. That wouldn't have been practical. So what the allies did was they knew that every single day that the Germans would send out a weather report. And the thing is that the Germans used the same format in the weather report and other messages. So the allies knew, okay, well, this is going to contain this wording for sure. And even though the Germans were changing the key every day, the allies were able to calculate it new every day because they knew that every single day they'd be sending out the same thing. So it's the same idea here. So how Wi-Fi is supposed to work, obviously, is that it's going to change the key for every single message so it can't be intercepted multiple times. And every time a new key is installed using message three right at the beginning, it starts a type of counter. So one, two, three for every message. It's a little bit different than that, but that's the basic of it. So now that we understand that, we can get to the core of the problem. So a hacker will receive message three, and even though they don't know what's in it, they'll send it to the device again, and they'll keep sending it. And here's the core of the vulnerability. When the device gets the new message three that was resent, it reinstalls the key again and resets the counter to zero. So now, based on what we just said, it might be pretty obvious how this is about to go down. The hacker is gonna get message three, resend it a bunch of times to the device, which is going to reinstall the key and reset it each time to that same initial key before it was changed, which means that it's going to keep reusing that key. So you get as many samples as you need to calculate it. And then because the hacker is probably gonna know how that device is iterating each next key, then you now can decrypt anything that that router is sending out. Because you know what the starting key is, you know what it's gonna do next, you don't have to even worry about it. Or just keep resending the key and you only have to decrypt the one. So hopefully that does make sense. I was reading a bunch of articles and none of them seemed to get to the core of how exactly it worked. They kind of said what the attack was called but didn't explain it. And I actually was reading through the website where they announced this hack. It's called crackattacks.com. You can read through it yourself. They have a ton of information on there. So that's where I basically got this and tried to re-explain it in a way that was easy for anyone to understand. So yeah, hopefully that should cover everything you need to know or didn't need to know. The thing you do need to do though is just patch all your devices and make sure you keep an eye out for any future ones if they're not available right now. Update Windows, I believe one is out for that. I think other operating systems are gonna roll it out pretty quickly. So keep an eye and keep everything up to date as usual. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. If you wanna keep watching, I'll put some other videos right here. You can just click on those. And if you wanna subscribe, I make a few videos every week, so it should be worth it. And also consider enabling notifications by clicking the bell next to the subscribe button or else YouTube might not show you my new videos at all. The algorithm is not that great. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. So as usual, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Have a good one.